we have anyone on the line. Yep. All right. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the people on the phone, and we're just getting started with our research lecture for tonight. And our first speaker tonight is Dr. Kristen Fussell. I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Fussell's background as she comes up to get set up. She's currently our executive assistant down in uh, Columbus, started with us about a year ago, just over a year ago. Uh, grew up in Ohio, graduated from uh, Westerville South High School, went on to Ohio Wesleyan, majored in Zoe, and then went to University of Toledo and started working on Lake Erie issues. And she was working with sort of benthic uh, macroinvertebrate invertebrates in their impact on sediment within the lake, and it's, you know, it's a critically important area. I'm sure some of you have been out and taken sediment cores or grabbed Ekman dredges out there, and Lake Erie gets more sediment than any of the other Great Lakes, and we have more critters living in that sediment than any of the other Great Lakes. And this is a real important topic to understand the relationship between those critters and the sediment. Uh, got her master's in ecology and then went on to get her PhD looking at the interactions between mayflies and zebra and guava mussels, mussels the dracaenids, and that's what she's going to be talking to us about today. But before she came to us, and after graduating with a PhD from University of Toledo, she spent two, uh, three years working for Stu Lutzen in the Aquatic Ecology Lab at Ohio State as a postdoc. And there she was looking at sort of the, the biological and physical interactions in Lake Erie on larval walleye and what determines your class strength within walleye, working for three years on that, uh, we were incredibly pleased when we were able to attract her and get her to come to uh, Stone Laboratory in Sea Grant. And so, Dr. Fussell, uh, we're Thanks. real pleased. As you start tonight, would you uh, Tell the students a little, how did you make decisions, say, coming out of high school as far as picking your schools? Uh, again, you made the mistake of not going to Ohio State, <laughs> but it's not there. <laughs> so how, and how'd you pick majors and things like that? Okay, so um, before I, I start my talk, I will do just that. Well, I guess I, I graduated high school knowing I enjoy sciences. That was pretty much it. I, I wanted to major in something that had to do with science. and. I really liked organisms, so I knew I liked things larger than a cell or something like that. So I wanted to work with organisms. Um, I went to Ohio Wesleyan because I was really interested in um, their programs with the Columbus Zoo. So I thought, well, maybe a zookeeper would be a, a good career. And I was also interested in veterinary medicine. So I kind of went back and forth. I worked at a, um, a veterinary hospital through undergrad, and I also did a short internship um, at the Columbus Zoo, so I was a gorilla keeper for a summer. Um, so I, I kind of tested things out, and, and nothing was feeling right. Um, and then the summer between my junior and senior year of undergrad, I um, got a summer scholarship to do research with a professor at Ohio Wesleyan um, on aquatic pond ecosystems, and I was hooked, and that was it. So um, then the summer after I graduated, I went up to Michigan State's Biological Station and worked as a, a technician for the summer up there, and then um, kind of took a year off applying to graduate school, and, and that's how it happened. So I did, I did not enter undergrad knowing what I wanted to do, just all worked itself out while I was in school. Were so. some of those positions uh, paid and some voluntary that you were getting started with with Wesleyan? And with yeah, so my first starts in, in research, those were voluntary. Um, I just saw a bunch of people going out to a pond and coming back muddy and looked like a good time, so I volunteered to help out with some projects. And that led to a professor um, accepting me for a summer position. Um, and then, and that was great. And then um, she was the one actually doing research up at Michigan State, so it was a pretty easy transition up there. And then I went on to graduate school. So, yeah, it all fell into place. And now here I am. And I, I'm going to take the next 40 minutes or so talking about interactions between mayflies and uh, zebra and quagga mussels in Lake Erie. Um, 
I came here thinking, you know, which which presentation am I going to give? I've kind of switched gears a few times here throughout my career. But I thought, you know, Chris Vandergoot's already been up here and gave a walleye lecture, so maybe I won't do that again. And, and, I, and I haven't talked about mayflies since probably 2012. And after seeing the windows here covered in adult mayflies, I thought I'd bring them back and, and give a, a little short talk on uh, hexagenia. Okay. So the question I was kind of looking at for my PhD um, in Toledo was how native hexagenia, so these are native benthic invertebrates, uh, respond to invasive species and other changing conditions in Lake Erie. Um, and changing conditions like uh, low dissolved oxygen, um, changes in substrate type, organic matter, algae, uh, risk of predation by fish. Okay, so the two questions I'm going to look at today. Um, so first, examine the spatial relationship of hexagenia and dracaena. And dracaena are just zebra and quagga mussels. And I'll talk a little bit more about their, their biology. And um, also to examine the effect of dracaena presence and low oxygen concentrations on the availability of these benthic invertebrates to fish. Okay, so why study hexagenia, right? You guys are all pr probably pretty annoyed by mayflies. They attach to everything, and, and people tend to dislike the adult swarms. But that's only a, a really, really short snapshot of this organism's whole life cycle. So they spend two years as larvae down in the sediments in Lake Erie. And they build these U-shaped burrows beneath the sediment. And they use their gills here and kind of wave them back and forth. And, and water will constantly go through these burrows and keep them well oxygenated. It also brings in food for them to consume. Um, but they are highly sensitive to low oxygen concentrations. Um, my class knows all about biological indicators at this point. Um, and they were nearly extirpated from Lake Erie and also many other lakes in the area. So Green Bay, some of the Finger Lakes um, in the early 1950s. Uh, but their, their populations are, are resurging, or they're kind of back here in the Western Basin. But this kind of coincided with the invasion of zebra and quagga mussels. So kind of the early 90s, we started to see mayflies uh, reemerging, but that's also the same time that zebra and quagga mussels were first found in the Great Lakes. And also, why do we care about mayflies? They're a really important food resource for fish. So uh, especially yellow perch really like to consume uh, the larval form of these mayflies. Okay, so Dracaena species, again, zebra and quagga mussels, they're mostly quagga mussels at this point. And I was really interested in these clusters that kind of cover soft sediment. So the areas in which hexagenia, you know, their usual preferred habitat where they've been found, is now and portions of the lake completely covered by these quagga mussel clusters. Um, and this is what's called ecosystem engineering. So an organism can actually change the physical structure um, of the lake bottom. And so I was really interested in the implications to the abundance and the availability of hexagenia to fish. Okay, so here's a picture from the lake. You can see these quagga mussel clusters, a little bit of algae here, and some hexagenia burrows. So these organisms live within fairly close proximity of one another. And just a kind of um, a sidetrack, funny story about how I came up with this. So I know a lot of people enter grad school and they're like, how am I ever going to think of what to study? It's going to be really hard. Um, this kind of just happened. Um, Ken Krieger, who works at Heidelberg uh, with Laura Johnson, came to the Lake Erie Center. I was doing a master's project looking at some benthic invertebrates, but not this specifically. Um, he came and gave a talk and, and just casually mentioned, yeah, Dracaena, they have negative impacts on mayflies. You know, they, they cover the preferred habitat of mayflies, so there's obviously these negative impacts. And I kind of, you know, thought and looked at my professor and I said, well, I'm out sampling all the time and, and I know when I want to find mayflies, I go to these spots that have a lot of Dracaena and that's where I'm finding them. And so then she kind of looked at me a little puzzled and that led to a whole entire PhD. 
So, so some, some small observation like that can lead to something much larger. Okay, so for the first, uh, looking at the spatial relationship between mayflies and Dreisina, I'll first talk about a small scale habitat selection experiment, and then looking at a large scale western basin scale mapping and spatial analysis. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a lot of um, experiments conducted in these blue tubs here. They're my tubs of science. Um, so just your blue tubs that you find in your garage with basketballs in them. Um, so for my first small scale habitat selection experiment, I had three habitat types. So just plain bare sediment, which was, you know, used to be thought as the preferred habitat uh, for burrowing mayflies. And so this represents no added structure to the sediment and no additional food resources. I also had artificial clusters. So these were washed up quagamuscle shells that we glued back together to kind of form um, a cluster. And this represents structure only. So this is added structure to the sediment. And then I had my live Dreisina cluster area. And this is additional structure and food. So Dreisina, when they're, fil they're filter feeders, they bring water down from the water column, filter out algal particles. But some of this algae, they're, they're picky eaters. They don't want to eat everything, so they package up this algae and spit it back out. And that's what's called pseudofeces, fake poop, I know. Um, but it's, it's algal cells that are not di digested, and mayflies will consume these. And so, I have my three, my three uh, habitats set up. I released mayflies at the top of the water column. The experiments ran for 48 hours. Um, and in the end, we just sieved all this dirt and counted where the mayflies were. I did this across uh, a range of five mayfly densities from 100 to 1200 per meter squared. These are all, this is a range of densities you know, found in Western Lake Erie. This is what we found. The pink, is a live Dreisina cluster habitat. Blue is artificial and yellow is bare. And this is the percent hexagenia in each habitat type. You can see that mayflies overwhelmingly selected for this live Dreisina cluster habitat, followed by artificial clusters. And then the bare sediment was only selected for these really high densities of mayflies. Okay, so that was the first, and we're like, okay, maybe we're on to something here, right? But then we moved to this large-scale mapping and spatial analysis. I used survey data collected by Don Schlosser at the USGS Great Lakes Science Center in Ann Arbor. Um, and I mapped the average density of hexagenia and Dreisina at each site. Um, I used data from 1999 through 2009, about 25 sites per year in Western Lake Erie. And here's a map of all the, the sample sites that were used. And here we are. Okay, so yes, this graph is really messy, but I'm going to highlight some stuff. So here is just every site graphed across all years. Um, so each point represents an individual site in an individual year. And what you see is that when Dreisina are absent, so hex, whoops, that's not the pointer. Hexagenia are here on the y-axis, Dreisina per meter squared on the x-axis. And when Dreisina are absent, the mayflies have a really wide range of density. Okay, so they can just be not present all the way up to, you know, over 2,000 per meter squared. So really wide range of density, and the mean density is about 384 per meter squared. When Dreisina are present, um, the hexagenia do not reach these really high densities, and their mean density is around 270 per meter squared. And this is actually within the uh, density that's rated excellent based on the Lake Erie Index of Biotic Integrity. So in conclusion, at the small scale, hexagenia select for live Dreisina, but at the large scale, we do find more hexagenia when Dreisina are absent, although this is highly variable. Uh, but what we found is that hexagenia presence is positively related to Dreisina presence, 
but hexagenia density is not related to dreissena density. And the way I like to explain this is if you're sending your friend out to sample mayflies in western Lake Erie, if they want to find a lot of mayflies, odds are probably better to go to a site that does not have zebra or mussels. Okay, so they may end up with no mayflies, but they may get one of these sites that have 2,000 per meter squared. So you're more likely to find a site that has a lot of mayflies. However, if your friend just wants to see a mayfly, they just want to, to touch one and, and observe what one mayfly looks like, uh, they're probably better to go to a site with Dreissena because their pres presence is positively related to Dreissena presence. Okay, so now we have this spatial relationship. Um, we're going to move on to examining the effects of Dreissena presence and low oxygen concentrations on how available these um, mayflies are to fish. So how easy is it for a fish predator to consume mayflies? And I'm going to talk about two experiments, um, one being a fish foraging experiment and the other looking more at hypoxia or low oxygen. Okay, so again, mayflies are a very important food resource for fish. Um, and this is because they're very large compared to other benthic prey. So here's a picture of a mayfly next to a chronomid, another commonly consumed benthic invertebrate. And my students in my class should be able to identify these and tell you the order after, um, after this lecture. But as you can see, the mayflies are much, much larger than this chironomid right here, right? So I like to refer to them as like the Big Mac of Lake Erie. When fish can find these invertebrates, it's a lot of bang for their buck. There's a high caloric content in this mayfly versus this tiny little chronomid. So they don't have to eat as many of these um, to fill their bellies. So they're very, very important. Okay, so two questions that we kind of looked at in this fish foraging experiment. First of all, do Dreissena clusters reduce fish predation on mayflies? So a lot of this research um, was initially done looking at amphipods in zebra mussel clusters. And a lot of people were finding that fish had a, had a harder time consuming amphipods in these clusters rather than outside on the bare sediment. And I know some of that initial research was conducted here at Stone Lab by Maria Gonzalez. Um, but I hypothesized that Dreissena clusters would decrease the consumption of hexagenia by fish. Um, and then I also looked at if this effect is altered based on the fish's feeding style. So hypothesizing that a generalist feeder, such as yellow perch, would experience more reduced consumption or have more difficulty consuming hexagenia than a strictly benthic feeder that's already feeding on these, such as a round goby. So kind of thinking that maybe since round gobies are already consuming Dreissena and rooting around in the sediment for food, maybe this spatial relationship would actually benefit round gobies because they may find some extra food. So to do this, I initially set out, again, with my blue tubs of science. Um, I had tubs with just bare sediment, and I was thinking, okay, well, I'll just add mayflies to these and let my fish forage, right? And I had some, some sediment that I covered with quagga mussels, and that was my Dracaena-covered sediment. But what happened was that I ended up with this. So mayflies are also an ecosystem engineer. They're what we call bioturbators. So they build these U-shaped burrows, and they're, they're flushing water through their burrow. And at the same time, they're kicking up sediment. So they make the water extremely turbid at the sediment water interface. So if you dive down in Lake Erie, you can actually see this. OK, so now I have turbid water with bare sediment and clear water with Dreissena, and I'm now just um, I have two variables that I've changed, so I need to fix this, right? So I added a Dreissena covered sediment turbid water treatment where I constantly pumped in turbid water at a rate um, in which the zebra mussels could not filter them out. So again, I have things filtering water, making this really clear, and I have organisms making these tanks really turbid. Um, I did everything I could to try to come up with a bare sediment, clear water treatment, but 
Mayflies, they're good at what they do, so I could not clear that water. I spent a whole summer trying to do that, actually. <laughs> Things you do in grad school. Okay, so here are my three treatments. I did this for both uh, yellow perch and round gobies. Uh, added one fish per tank. I knew the number of mayflies that I added to the tank. I let the fish feed for 24 hours. And then after that period, removed all the sediment and counted the number of mayflies remaining. This is what I found. So here we have graphed the number of mayflies consumed in a 24 hour period. And here are my treatments. And here are the pictures um, of the different treatments. And what we found was that yellow perch consumption of hexagenia was not affected between these two treatments, so when the light levels varied. However, yellow perch consumption of hexagenia decreased with Dreisina only in this turbid condition. So Dreisina covered sediment and turbid water decreased the amount of mayflies that yellow perch could consume. On to round gobies. Same graph, number of mayflies consumed in 24 hours. Again, round goby consumption of mayflies was not affected when light levels varied. However, similarly, uh, consumption decreased in this turbid water Dreisina covered sediment treatment. So in conclusion for that experiment, uh, Dreisina covered sediment did lower consumption. However, this is only the case in turbid conditions. For example, the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, consumption of hexagenia was reduced for both yellow perch and round gobies. Uh, but when the conditions were clear, Dreisina did not impede fish predation of the mayflies. Onto my hypoxia experiment. So the question uh, we posed was what are the effects of hypoxia on the habitat preference of um, hexagenia? So zebra mussels, as we all know, oops, consume oxygen. The studies have shown that some of this water in these interstitial spaces can be quite low um, when you get a, a dense cluster of mussels. So we had hypothesized that hexagenia would avoid these clusters during low oxygen conditions and that they would leave their burrows more often in hypoxic conditions compared to normoxic or high oxygen. Um, to do this experiment, we used um, what I call my hexagenia behavioral arenas. <laughs> and really, these are just ant farms that we uh, constructed that were just wide enough to fit an oxygen probe and um, so that we could see where the mayflies so the same idea as an ant farm, but for mayflies. Um, to do this, uh, we had three habitat types again, my live Dreisina, artificial clusters, and bare sediment. We conducted all pairwise comparisons of these uh, habitat types. For treatments, we had uh, treatments with fish present. So I would kind of shove a yellow perch <laughs> in this, uh, <laughs> in my behavioral arenas for the fish present treatment and then we had treatments without fish. Um, and then we had high oxygen versus hypoxia. So all um, treatments had both high oxygen conditions and then hypoxia was imposed at 24 hours. So just to walk you through some of these, what this graph will look like. I'm graphing the proportion of hexagenia in each habitat type. So initial hour zero, six hexagenia were added to the tank. So we would just observe where they initially chose to start to burrow. And come in a day later and observe where the hexagenia are located um, in reference to these the two habitat treatments. And then we would bubble in nitrogen and lower the oxygen to less than 30% saturation and observe again the mayflies for, for 15 minutes after that. So our observation immediately following hypoxia. And then we let these the hypoxia go for about three hours um, and then took an observation after three hours of hypoxia. And so I know the western basin is not the central basin. It doesn't stratify. We don't get this area of really, really low oxygen. But it stratification can set up 
and the amount of water beneath that thermocline is so small that low oxygen conditions do happen in the western basin of Lake Erie, and they can happen very quickly. Now, the next storm that, that rolls through will definitely mix it up, but this does happen. Okay, so for some graphs. And I want to note, these are all with predator present. We did not see a difference between having a fish in the tank versus no fish, so I'm not going to show those treatments. But what I have graphed here is through time, so from the initial high oxygen, the 24 hours post, hypoxia onset, and then three hours of hypoxia, the proportion of mayflies in each habitat, the green is the bare sediment, yellow is live, and this purple color is the artificial clusters. And so again, the hexagenia is selected for the structured habitat. In these treatments, there were no differences between the live and the artificial clusters, but they did overall, regardless of oxygen, they were most often found in this structured habitat. Um, so again, through time, this is the proportion of hexagenia out of their burrow in each habitat. So this is the pr proportion of mayflies that came out of the burrow um, for each of these time periods. Again, initially, most of them were burrowed. Um, then during hypoxia, the number of hexagenia out of their burrow increased with hypoxia duration. So the longer the slow oxygen concentration continued, the more mayflies came out of their burrow. Also, fewer hexagenia came out of their burrow in the bare habitat. So in the bare sediment, less mayflies came out of their burrow. More mayflies came out of the burrow in the live and artificial. But when we talk about coming out of their burrow, this just meant that they, like I said, came out of their burrow. But in the structured habitat types, that doesn't mean that they were outside of some sort of structure and fully available for fish predation. So here's a picture of a mayfly. Came out of its burrow, but it's still wedged really well in that cluster. So it's, again, not really exposed to the, the water column. Here's a mayfly out of its burrow, just wedged between that, the sediment and the bottom of the cluster. We actually found a lot of mayflies like this, regardless of oxygen concentration. So some of the mayflies in this habitat didn't even make U-shaped burrows. They just hung out right beneath the cluster. And here's one that's actually above the cluster and ex exposed. So in conclusion for that, um, hexagenia selected for structure um, covered sediment. There was no difference between the live and artificial Dreissena at this scale. Um, they came out of their burrows during hypoxia. And again, this is a very short period of hypoxia. This is only three hours. Um, if I let it go much longer, the mayflies did not fare too well. So, so we had to keep it short. Um, they did this more often in the structured habitat, and they tended to stay in the bare sediment uh, longer. And the presence of the predator really had a minimal effect on, on mayfly behavior. So what's that mean for the food web? Um, Dreissena colonized sediment, it may reduce the flow of this benthic energy source to fish in western Lake Erie uh, due to its high turbidity. Um, Dreissena presence may provide refuge for hexagenia during short-term hypoxia. And it's this really interesting behavioral trade-off between low oxygen and fish predation. So hexagenia are very sensitive to these low oxygen concentrations. Uh, they tend to die if they're, they're in these uh, conditions for very long. However, a mayfly out of its burrow is likely fish food. So, so it's a, a really unique situation with pressure coming from both the fish and the dissolved oxygen. And here's a really cute picture of a mayfly trying to burrow right beneath one lone cluster or one lone fog of mussel in a, in a tank. So with that, that's it. Um, acknowledgements, and I was going through, I was telling Matt yesterday, I was going through this, I haven't given this presentation and I don't know how long. An Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab comes up twice on my acknowledgement slide from my dissertation. So I received um, some funds to conduct this work and some ship time. 
And I used to come up here and bug Matt Thomas all the time to uh, keep all the quagga mussels that they trawl in a cooler for me so I could, I could run all these experiments. Um, yeah, and with that, I have, I don't know how we are on time, I have uh, plenty more stuff that I can talk to you about, um, ask some questions. Um, I love talking about mayflies. I have some, some really cool long-term temporal data, too, so, so plenty to talk about. And I would like to take any questions. Thanks very much. <laughs> questions for uh, Dr. Fossil? Come on. I've, I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, do you notice, uh, are, in addition to eating the pseudo feces, are they eating the feces? They could be. Yeah. And I think, I mean, and with those first experiments, it really goes to show that it's the added food resource that's um, really attracting these mayflies uh, to that habitat. And so what we've seen is that it's extra food. So it's like they're living beneath, you know, a fast food restaurant. And then a lot of them are not spending the energy to conduct these burrows and, and constantly flush water through them. So, so it's less energy to expend to do that. and a lot of food. And the, the fact that they don't even need to create a burrow, that they can just yeah. you know, puddle in close to the food source. Yeah, they can't do that on bare sediment for obvious reasons due to fish predation, but with the added structure, they tend to, And I even found that sampling in, you know, Lake Erie doing a bunch of Ekmans or Ponar dredges. When I was trying to find mayflies, a lot of times I would find them in an open shell of a cluster or, yeah, just right beneath the clusters where we could pull out a lot of mayflies. So, so they're really using this uh, habitat. Yes. Um, in the native range of the zebra and quagga mussels, do they, at the name of that researcher, yeah. Not that I know of, no. I'm not sure what benthic and vertebrates are really prominent there, other than was um, what's the kind of preferred sediment type for for mayflies and and they were yet they were on the decline prior to zebra mussels um, and now have kind of make a made a resurgent um, so yeah they were on the decline you know in the 50s or so and then we really didn't see many if any for a, a long period of time and then um, the, yeah, their their reintroduction kind of coincided with the, a zebra mussel and quagga mussel invasion, likely due to just simply to better water quality um, conditions. But their preferred habitat is usually thought to be, you know, soft, silty sediments, um, soft enough that they can burrow in, but not so silty that the burrow will collapse. Um, so I actually have. Maybe not. Um, I actually looked at, okay, so um, we tend to find this is high concentrations of mayflies, those are hexagenia density and categories. Um, you tend to find them, you know, at this given percent silt. So um, they have a lower percent silt, so it's thought to be um, not as, as so fine that the burrows will. So, and then they're also found in areas with high organic matter in the, in the sediment for food purposes. When you look at those three sediment types as far as uh, how much silt, for instance, what's preferred for the uh, zebra mussel, quagga mussel? I find them everywhere. No preference. No, so it's really wherever 
I mean, there has to be some sort of, usually they, they'll start with some sort of larger particle, whether it's a, a small pebble or a rock or, or some hard, small, hard object in the soft sediment. And then they just go from there, building a cluster off of one another and just kind of across the sediment. So we've found them in a range of, of sediment types. The only thing is when it's really silty or in areas where, um, you know, there's a lot of sediment at the sediment water interface, it can really interfere with their filter feeding. So their filters can get clogged. Um, and so they'll tend to not do well in that habitat. But. All right, so I'm wondering if the, uh, the fact that the exogenia can get in close to the zebra mussels and the expansion of zebra mussels, if now the exogenia can move into softer okay. substrate. Yeah, that's a possibility. So, yeah. So when your exogenia ant farm, you said you put fish in there with them. Did you see the fish, like, actually? No, we had a, a barrier between okay. them. So um, it had, you know, it was a mesh barrier so that the water could, could actively move through the water column, but we did not want the fish to actually eat the mayflies in that experiment. But yeah, we did change the results in it? It could have. We were trying to get more of just the scent yeah. of the fish. Um, we had tried it with. Uh, water from aquaria that had fish in it. We saw no effect. We the when we added the fish, but maybe if I allowed them to actively feed. The only thing is these were so thin that um, they might get stuck too. So could the fish even turn around? I know. They like, did. They, they from one side. <laughs> yeah, they could kind of turn around. So these were age one yellow perch. So they were pretty small, but. And they could kind of swim back and forth. And they were removed prior to hypoxia. Yeah, what, yeah, because I couldn't ants. leave them in there. Those were not ants. What did you so, my, my behavioral arenas. <laughs> um, but they were modeled, yeah, the same idea. I actually built those myself to be the exact width of a YSI oxygen from. To sure. Where they start using the same preference Sure. Um I mean that's that's a possibility. There's still so you know, in terms of the whole Western basin, there's so much space that's not covered uh by these clusters and we do still find a lot of mayflies just on this regular bare sediment. Um but I mean, we just this year we're seeing this mayfly pattern um, where we're seeing a lot of a lot of adults into kind of into this early fall, and we've always seen that. That's really nothing new. I think the density may be a little higher, um, and usually these are mayflies that only live about a year in the lake. So the ones that come out in the fall are usually ones that just grow big enough, have enough energy that they can emerge prior to the winter season. And we're seeing more of that. So something to watch out for. Thanks very much, Dr. Fussell. I think we'll uh, go right into our guest speaker tonight. Uh, I think we're uh, very fortunate to uh, be able to get the director of Ohio EPA to uh, come in and speak to us. And, and this is an incredibly uh, busy time uh, in that this harmful algal bloom is over top of water intakes. And tomorrow morning, he will be visiting two water treatment plants uh, with his staff, helping those people uh, understand how to remove the toxin and produce safe drinking water. Uh, this is literally almost to the day one year ago that we had the Toledo water crisis. Uh, so this is, this is uh, I, I think we're incredibly fortunate to get uh, Director Butler to come in to, uh, to speak to us. I want to tell you a little bit about his background. And Director Butler, if you'd also, when you get started, 
go with the same explanation that Kristen did on and how you made decisions and, and the things that maybe helped you along the way in, in gaining meaningful employment. <laughs> uh, started at, uh, grew up in Pennsylvania, started at Mansfield University in Pennsylvania and majored in geography and environmental science. Then went on to Ohio University and got a master's in environmental science and then went immediately into an internship at Ohio EPA. And I'll ask you to talk about that internship and also I, I know a number of our uh, former students uh, work for you now and also got started with internships. And that's why I was asking you early on about your starting with voluntary. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't even need to be paid. You wanted to get your foot in the door and that was a real smart move that I think a lot of people have, have, have used over the years. Uh, and I believe that was about 1991 that you were looking at, uh, and really first looking at life cycles and um, recyclables, so uh, uh, recycling, uh, and stayed at EPA for essentially 20 years at that point to uh, 2010, uh, and then left EPA and went to the governor's office and was the governor's policy director for environment and energy and agriculture. And those are all obviously three things that are incredibly important to us here right now. And, and to come in today to speak to us about first, what is Ohio doing to address the problems that we have? And then some things related to water treatment plants and what they, they might do and how we even could be uh, now trying to implement new guidelines from US EPA on policy or on, on toxins. So uh, with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Director Craig Butler from Ohio EPA. Uh, Dr. Ryder, thank you. It's great to be back. I look at you standing there, and then I look up at your picture on the wall. That was just before the water crisis. I can tell. Yeah, I had hair before that, too. So you, you mentioned uh, our issues with Toledo, and um, so I'm at 300 and, um, 369 days is, is my tally since, uh, since we had, uh, I think on August 2nd of last year, where we had half a million people in a major metropolitan area in Toledo as parts as well as some smaller water systems in Michigan, uh, where we had to uh, make a decision as well as with this mayor of Toledo to tell people that their water wasn't safe to drink. Um, that was a very sad day for us. Um, it also um, was, a, frankly, a wake-up call again um, around harmful algal, how harmful algal blooms, not just relative to what the impact they may have on recreational contact, but more importantly in that perspective about the toxins that can be um, generated from the harmful algal blooms and the impacts that they can have on water treatment systems. In some cases, their inability to treat for those toxins. So we have been looking at um, this issue for a ma many years, and I will take you through a, a progression of things that we have been working on since 2010, mostly in the policy arena. So I'm going to shift you completely away from Dr. Fessel had talked about kind of the scientific basic research around um, micro macroinvertebrates, which is really important and a lot of fun to, to see to see that. I had more questions to ask you that I'll probably ask you later on, but it's just really my inability to understand more than anything else. So. I'm going to shift you away and give you a sense of what, what I do on a, almost a daily basis working with policy leaders in the state, elected officials, legislators, mayors, the governor, uh, on taking basic research that is done in organizations like here at Sea Grant in Ohio State, at, at Heidelberg, um, at University of Toledo, at Bowling Green, um, and in lots of other universities, uh, and take that base information um, we call it adaptive management. You'll hear me talk about it from the policy perspective, too, how we take, use adaptive management on the policy side to take the best science that we've got uh, and make the best policy decisions we can um, about how we impact um, human, humans' lives as well as allocate scarce resources, both human resources and economic resources. My background, as Jeff wanted me to tell you a, lot, a little about it, because um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Maybe that's a common trait. Maybe some of you all, since you're here, 
and most of you in high school, right? Is that, is that right? Some, yeah, right. most of you are in high school. Uh, the fact that you're actually here taking college classes in the sciences probably is a pretty good indication that they knew more, Kristen, yeah. than probably you and I did at that time in our lives about what we wanted to do with our lives. <clears throat> uh, I, I use this over and over again. Um, in high school, I was, my dad would tell me I was an overachiever at underachieving um, because I didn't study a lick. Um, I just kind of skated by. I liked to be outdoors. I knew that. Um, I liked to play football. I knew that. But outside of that, I didn't have a clue. Um, graduated high school. Um, I went to college lo locally at Mansfield University uh, because it was close. And I think my dad was worried that if I failed out that I wouldn't have too far to come home. Um, so it was really an interesting time in my life. Um, but there were a few real key uh, points when I got into college and a few key people that helped me along the way. And you, you probably will experience it. Maybe you have already here uh, with some of the professors that you're interfacing with. But I had one particular professor. I didn't even declare a major until I was a junior and they sent me a letter saying, son, we're going to kick you out of school unless you declare a major <laughs> because, because it was a school policy saying you had to have a major. So. But by that time, I thought I already had knew what I wanted to uh, to actually study, and I studied a I got a degree in geography and environmental science because there was one professor, there was a business school professor and the geography professor, that really taught me how to learn. Um, and I don't know how they did it, um, but they taught me uh, they taught me how to learn. They taught me what it was um, like to ask intriguing questions and want to do some basic research in science. Um, and from that point, um, I kind of got it, you know. So I. I graduated from there and um, was looking for some environmental programs and masters uh, because I really didn't think you could do much with a geography degree in an undergrad. Um, and I made my way to high university, and again, I made a decision to made a decision to go to high university rather than some other schools on engineering for two reasons. And again, they're really one was geography. You know, it's a high university is a beautiful campus. When you drive on when you drive on campus, it's in the Appalachian region, very much where I grew up in Pennsylvania. I drove in and I said, I think I'm home. Felt like home. And there was also the director of that program um, just made me feel at home. Um, just decisions like that, you know them when you feel them, you know they feel right. So I went to school at a high university, got a master's in environmental science. Um, and I started as an intern at Ohio EPA out of the sheer reason that I needed a job. Uh, I was. Um, I needed some work because the university paid an internship or a stipend uh, and a graduate assistantship over a nine-month period, so you needed to find something to do for the summer. Um, and then just because I had been uh, doing some teaching at one of the branch campuses, I ran into a, or a, uh, a person that was um, employed at Ohio EPA, and he clued me into an internship. My complete expectation was I would work there for six months. Uh, it would give me enough time to finish up my master's thesis, um, and I would um, go out in the private sector, make my fortune, and life would be good. Life got in the way, um, more so in that I also learned a really important thing in my life is that public service, I enjoy it. Um, I really enjoy helping um, people that come into Ohio EPA, frankly, help them manage their way through complex environmental regulatory structures to get done what they want to do, build things, make things. Um, so it's been a passion of mine, and um, uh, for the last 20 years that I, I was there have gone by um, unbelievably quickly. It's probably like Jeff for you, the 30 plus years that you were here. Um, every day was a every day was a treat. So as uh, you know, don't don't feel bad. I guess the the message I'd tell you: don't feel bad if you don't know what you want to do. Um, but if you really do think you want to do, be open to other ideas because you never know. Uh, what doors are going to open for you, and you never know what life is going to throw at you, and you never know what, what turn or pathway you're going to go down. Um, it's always a good experience to be open to new ideas, and uh, you'll never know what you come up with. Um, so I, I'm going to take you through two presentations tonight. One is just about some policy responses that we have been, um, we as a state have been using to respond um, to the science that we're getting and looking at the issues related to nutrients and harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. And then from there, a little um, more scientific-based presentation just on the work we've been doing with US EPA relative to cyanobacteria testing 
and how we have been using that and updating that science relative to uh, drinking water and harmful algal blooms. So you're on the lake, you have been for at least a week. You've seen the lake in various stages. Today, it's green. There's not a scum on the lake because it's all broken up. Probably earlier this week, you've seen a scum. Justin talked about from here all the way to Toledo. Um, it's a thick scum of harmful algal bloom or algae. In fact, the new NOAA satellite pictures that we got this morning, normally you see like a, a gray. You know, it's a color graded scale on how, how um, much cyanotoxin I think they see in the water. Oh, yeah, you got it. And uh, I sent us another one, but you can kind of see, you can kind of see it here, and you can kind of see it here. But in a little higher resolution, when they get in and they're focusing in here, uh, it's like a, a gray area. Normally, it means like there's not enough data. There's like a cloud in the way or something that they can't, they just can't tell what's there. Um, there's a little footnote at the bottom, and it says, "We've got data there. The mat of algae is so thick that we can't get a reading off of it." I mean, so it's really. Um, and I was, we were just there, my daughter and wife were with me, and we were just fishing in that area last week, and it wasn't like that at all. So it happens quickly, changes very, very rapidly. Um, but when I go and talk to legislators that don't know anything about environmental things, and they don't know anything about phosphorus, and they don't know anything about nutrients, they always ask the first question, so what's wrong with the lake? What's wrong with the lake? And, you know, you could spend hours and hours talking about it, but I always say, there's too many nutrients from too many sources. I mean, it's really that, it is that simple, but it is not. Um, so then I have to spend some time because we are responding at multiple levels in multiple different ways. We have to then go to the next level and say, well, it's not really that simple. We have to understand what the sources are, where they're coming from, and then what's changed over time to put us in a predicament that we've got now. It's not that difficult to kind of start identifying some of these sources um, and then percentages of those sources that we've got. But agriculture, the western basin of the, in the Maumee River and the western basin of Lake Erie is some of the most productive farmland that we've got in the entire country. Um, it's also one of the areas where we have high proliferations of um, very large, I call them factory farms or combined animal feeding operations with very large populations of animals, be it hogs, chickens, or cows. Um, it is also areas where we have um, uh, a, a very silty material, the, the old black swamp that it used to be that were drained for, to get access to this really nutrient-rich um, soil, um, happens to also move very rapidly when um, it's rained on, just like in the heavy rains that we see being more prolific. So you see that sediment load in the Maumee. Jeff had mentioned this earlier. Maumee River, um, I think it's true, Jeff, is that right, that the Maumee River sediment load is more than all of the other tributaries in to the Great Lake combined, or at least Lake Erie combined. Definitely Lake Erie. Definitely Lake yeah. Erie combined. So um, and here's a here's an interesting testament to that. So we dredge a lot of the navigation channels to keep them open. We dredge a million and a half cubic yards of material out of the Maumee River Channel every year um, to keep it open for commerce. And that's about a third of all of the material we dredge out of eight of our federal navigation channels total. So just that fact alone um, gives you an indication that it's a different material um, uh, in, the, in the resource. So agriculture plays a huge, fact, huge part in this. Both agricultural practices have changed, um, the types of agriculture that they're doing, the, um, the intense agriculture that we've got. Um, they know they're a part of this problem. Um, they're implementing some things to, to make it uh, to make it better. I think they need to do some additional work, but but ultimately they seem to be um, recognizing that they are not a source, but the major source of nutrients in in phosphorus in the western basin. Wastewater treatment plants, combined sewer overflows. All of our wastewater treatment plants now have phosphorus limits, uh, really low phosphorus limits of a part per million or less, um, discharging into into Lake Erie. Um, Combined sewer overflows is the issue we've got where it seems like mostly in the Midwest for the past 50 years, engineers had always designed wastewater treatment systems to combine storm sewers and residential septic sewers. Um, and then they said, well, we'll just build really big treatment plants to process all of that. And then they found out it was way too expensive um, and that decoupling those was something that we needed to do. And when you get really heavy rains, you can't can't bring all that flow into the plant. You get some rub, sewage, and stormwater going into the lake directly. 
2013, just over 6 billion gallons of untreated, untreated combined sewer overflows in the lake. It was over 10 billion in 2011. So it's a huge problem. Uh, we've got over 100 communities that have these combined sewer overflows. We have uh, what we call a long-term control plan. Uh, so they're under either a state or a federal order to correct these. They can cost anywhere anywhere from a few hundred thousands dollars for a really small community to a community like Toledo, over a billion, um, Cleveland, three and a half, Columbus, five billion dollars. So we put them on very lengthy schedules so that they don't have to um, ask their residents to pay um, a bill that they aren't able to pay in terms of combined sewer overflows. So some of them are on schedules that could be as long as 30 years um, to implement combined sewer overflow management. And I'm going to talk a little more about how we're trying to accelerate that um, to start treating some of that. Home sewage is another issue for us. You would think it really wouldn't be that big a deal, but um, soils in Ohio, in Ohio tend not to be great for on-lot septic systems. Um, they just don't last that long. 15 years probably is a good time frame on how long they tend to last, and then they fail. You get rid of the biological treatment, and you have um, discharge of those nutrients into the waterways as well. <clears throat> Our estimates with the health department suggest it's about a, it would take about $2 billion of investment for us to go in and fix all the failing septic systems um, in, in the Western Basin. And in some counties, when we talk to local health departments, some counties um, estimate that virtually all of the septic systems that have been built um, prior to the last 10 years are failed. Um, so we've got just a massive um, issue relative to have home sewage contribution for that. And last, and I think it's probably the least, but we have different policy objectives here. It's about dredge material. We talked about the million and a half cubic yards of material um, out, of the, out of the Maumee. We've got material in, in Cleveland, Ashtabula, Fairport Harbor, and all the ports across. Um, that is typically taken. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers dredge that material. They put it in a scow. They take it a few miles away and redeposit it on the bottom of the lake. And I think there is some research going on about since they're resuspending that material, that nutrient-laden, phosphorus-rich material, is that also adding additional phosphorus and nutrients into the water column for, for um, to be consumed by the algae. The other issue is we just don't think you ought to put it in the lake. Um, we'd prefer, frankly, to find different sources for that. And I will tell you that the catchphrase I use when I talk to politicians about this is some of the best farmland that we've got in the state of Ohio is sitting on the bottom of Lake Erie because it's made its way out through the Maumee River. So we need to stop the practice of putting it farther out in the lake. We also need to keep it on the land where it is. Um, but if we're going to dredge it, we need to bring it out of the watershed so it's not contributing materials for phosphorus into the water column and find a productive use for it. So I will not talk a lot about this next, but there's a lot has also changed in, in the method of delivery of nutrients, but also this issue of dissolved reactive phosphorus that's getting a lot of attention from Laura uh, Johnson at Heidelberg and just the issues and all the research going on to figure out what has changed in the environment. It used to be farmers would bank phosphorus. They would, they would say, I don't know how much, I, I'm not going to test my soil, but I've always put this much on. And it, it could have been, it was generally an over-application. And the thought was phosphorus will bind to the soil particle. It will stay there until the plant comes along, takes it up, and uses it. That's not the case anymore. Um, well, that still is the case. But something else is happening there where you're seeing this phosphorus, there's this new dissolved uh, form of reactive phosphorus being able to flush its way out. And it's not just going to sit there. So you can't bank phosphorus the way you used to do that. So you, all know, you also know this as well, but um, when we talk about nutrients, you've got to make that crosswalk fairly quickly into this, which is what happens when you have too many nutrients. You know, one of those is we've got a lot of harmful algal blooms or a lot of algae, which relating to harmful algal blooms. And we've been recognizing this, and we've been testing for HAB since 2008. And our first wake-up call um, across the state was algal blooms at Grand Lake St. Mary's. And I don't know, anybody know Grand Lake St. Mary's? Yeah, we got a few. We got a few. It's a canal lake um, in, um, in, in the Western Basin, just on the edge of the Western Basin. These canal lakes are when and we had a series of canals that needed feeder ponds. 
They're really shallow, number one, kind of like the Western Basin, relative to its size. Um, they don't have a lot of uh, flow or exit flow going into them, so they tend to they tend to be a little bit stagnant. Grand Lake was heavily developed as well, so they had a lot of dead end channels. They had a lot of stagnant water. Um, they also have a huge, very small watershed around the lake, and a significant number of these factory farms, CAFO farms, around the lake within the watershed. So it's setting this up. You can kind of see the this being set up here as kind of a perfect storm, if you will, of of all of the things that you would need uh, to start generating large um, amounts of not just algae but harmful algae on the lake. And we got that response, and we've had it before, but in 2010 was really the wake-up call when um, not only did we have a significant algal response, we saw people getting sick from being in contact with the water. Uh, recreational boaters, um, the, the lake has always been green. Historically, Grand Lake has, has been green, but we started seeing people get sick, get a rash, um, have other impacts. We saw pet death, had pet deaths from, the, from being just in contact with the water. Um, so, in fact, when Governor Kasich came into office, this was just shortly after he was elected, and it, this, this issue became aware just a couple of months, frankly, and I was not director at the time, but I was working on his staff. Um, you know, he basically sent me, our director of EPA at the time, director of natural resources, director of agriculture, before they even, frankly, had moved into their offices at the time to get to Grand Lake to start understanding what the problem was there and what were we going to do to fix it. We've got other lakes as well um, around the state, so it's not just in Lake Erie, but we've identified algae and harmful algae and microcystin um, in our other inland lakes and other sources of drinking water across the state. Um, so it seems to be um, universal in most of our lakes. 2013 um, was a precursor for us to Toledo. Carroll Township is just east of Toledo. Um, very small water system, about 2,000 residents there, maybe 2,500 residents. Very small water treatment system. Frankly, they don't have much in the way other than just elementary treatment. They don't have any way to do advanced treatment for microcystin from the harmful algal blooms. Um, we detected that they had um, an, an elevated uh, amount of microcystin in their finished drinking water. And it led to our first do not drink advisory basically telling people they couldn't drink the water. Um, we were able to rectify that in two ways. One, they had some bottled water, but more importantly, they had an interconnection with the neighboring community. So they were able to turn off their water treatment plant, tap, bring water in, and we were able to manage it that way. And then we had Toledo. Um, Toledo doesn't have anything. They've got one of the most unique water systems I've ever, ever, ever seen for a major metropolitan area. They have one source of water, which is the lake. They have one intake which is uh, three miles out in the lake, uh, and <clears throat> they don't have any interconnections with any other communities to provide them with backup water. They've got no upground storage. They've got no water towers. It's their only source of water. Um, so if they have a problem at their plant, um, it's going to be um, Im almost um, immediately felt by all of the residents. The other compounding factor in Toledo is it's a very, very old plant. Um, and had not seen upgrades or renovations for a very long time. Um, and it was not being run very effectively. So um, it took us several days to get their treatment plant re-optimized and get them back into um, a position where they could deliver um, healthy drinking water to the communities. But at that point, um, the damage had been done, so to speak. Um, and it left us to continue to, what's the solution? Again, what's the policy solution? So. I talk about this a lot. It's the adaptive management, which is the key. So whether it's in science um, or whether it is in safety, where you talk about um, uh, kind of the standard safety language is you plan, um, you do, and then you review, um, which is what we do in what you do in science and is what we do in the policy world too. Um, people say, "What are you going to do?" I said, "Well, we're going to take the best science that we've got. We're going to make decisions on how we um, allocate our resources, and then the most important thing is is we're going to watch it, see if it responds the way we thought it did, and if it does, great. If it doesn't, we're going to adapt, change our approach, and come back and do it again." So, um, one of those things that um, 
in response to Grand Lake, St. Mary's, and this need to find out what the science was telling us, uh, we brought together some really good scientists, including Dr. Reuter um, and others, um, to help us start understanding this issue of phosphorus. And this is going to become uh, more important as we go through this, but there were some key recommendations. One was focus on dissolved soft phosphorus, use adaptive management. In other words, start acting now uh, based on what we know. You can't wait. Um, focus on the dissolved phosphorus, which is becoming more, more and more important and known. And the third, which is we needed to see a 40% reduction. The 40% reduction was what the best science of the day told us to say, if you have a 40% reduction in the amount of phosphorus going into Lake Erie from the Western Basin, you want to eliminate this problem but you're more than likely to have to diminish the potential. And that's a key. Um, it's a key fact for us to remember. It's not going to eliminate this, um, and it, but it only gives us a fighting chance, as I say. And that, you'll see that number come back again. So again, going back to this issue around our first and foremost target is agriculture, working with the um, Farm Bureau, the Department of Agriculture, the state legislature, um, and our other policymakers. We Passed Senate Bill 150. Senate Bill 150 was key for a few reasons. First and foremost, to get away from this idea of soil banking or farmers just saying, I've always put this much on um, and I'm going to put this on again next year, regardless of whether I think I need all of that fertilizer or not, or actually having them make, making the farmers go out and do some soil testing. Um, you would think that they want to do that because they wouldn't want to waste the resource or waste the money, but um, they're a superstitious bunch, they are. Um, and I get it, you know, what worked for me last year or what worked for my, my father, what worked for my grandfather, I understand that. Um, but convincing them that they need to go out and do soil testing is, is a key fact um, and is helping. The second is just reduce, getting them introduced to the concept of these four R's in nutrients management. You're putting it on, like soil testing, you test it, put it on at the right place, at the right time, at the right pace. So making sure that you only put on what you need when you need it. And third, it's whether they're putting that on fertilizer on themselves or they're paying to have a commercial fertilizer applicator do that. It's to make sure that they're certified in the four R's and that they're following those recommendations. So we're going through a process now um, in hand in hand with support of the Ohio State Extension Office to do training. And we're training some 49,000 odd farmers um, and or certified <clears throat> crop applicators um, to take them through the course. It's a bolt on to their pesticide management course, um, so we don't have to have them come in twice for the, for the training. Um, and we think that um, from what we, some exit interviews, I guess you call them, when we talk to them, they say, did you learn anything? And they say, you know, I actually forgot some things that I actually relearned, um, or that they learned some things that they're now going to implement that we think is a good initial measure to see that they're starting to get it, which is helpful. So obviously Toledo is a real a wake up call for us again and you know we we immediately then started thinking that there's some real treatment options that we needed to make more widely available. Regular drinking water treatment typically doesn't um, except for chlorine um, and retention time of chlorine in, in the finished drinking water. Regular drinking water treatment doesn't really do much to the microsystem and the variance of the microsystem. So we needed, to, we needed to make some funding available to all of our water systems. So we immediately made $150 million available. And we made $100 million to our wastewater plants to have them upgrade their treatments for harmful algal blooms and reduce phosphorus into the western basin. We made $50 million available for our drinking water plants um, so that they could add more um, generally treatment for microcystin or other variants of that. And, um, and it's generally adding powder activated carbon treatment and some other applications. Um, we're going to make that, that same amount of money again available next year because we had a really high demand for that. Um, but we're going to continue um, targeting money in those areas um, to help them treat their drinking water and or reduce their nutrient loads from our wastewater plants. We also help, got some help from the federal EPA um, to again work with uh, the agriculture industry to put some of these newer practices in the ground, like controlled drainage structures, 
field tiles are prolific in Northwest Ohio. Field tiles are frankly the only reason you can do a lot of agriculture and farming in Northwest Ohio. My analogy to maybe some, some folks um, is like, field tiles are like a hypodermic. Um, they take the water off the fields and just inject it into the waterways. Um, we need to slow that down so that you can have that water get um, managed back into the back into the soil. Controlled drainage structures aren't that expensive, and basically it's a check valve at the end of your at the end of your pipe to help keep that water in your in your um, field tile, so that it has a, that it has an opportunity to to um, soak back into the ground. Manure storage is a big one, whether it's in Grand Lake or elsewhere. Um, at this point, you know I don't think we're ever going to see probably less. Um, animal husbandry in the western basin, so we got to figure out what to do with all the nutrients. Taking it out and spreading it on the ground um, just for a disposal practice isn't the way to go. So we're helping them build manure storage. It could be really simple. Um, it can be a concrete pad with a barn shed roof over it. Um, you just want to get it off the ground and you want to cover it. Um, and then they can apply it at the right time um, versus thinking that they just have to go apply it at the really inopportune time. And the last one here uh, about USGS and monitoring is going to also be important as we talk more about this, but monitoring our success. We're going to put a lot of practices in place. We're spending a lot of money. In fact, we've spent over a billion dollars just in Ohio. We've invested a billion dollars just in the Lake Erie Basin you know, since 2011 um, on putting practices in place to manage um, harmful algal blooms and nutrients. We need to be able to measure that to see if that money is being spent right. And the way we do that is do some monitoring within the tributaries and the main stem of the Maumee River. We also, are, it's a modest amount of money, but we're going to add more to this, this bottom piece, which is, again, um, adding some money for uh, health, health departments fix um, um, failing septic systems. So you're starting to see a response here that we're looking to identify all the sources of nitrogen or nutrients and phosphorus and then build um, what we think are effective practices to kind of minimize that in every one of these quadrants. This is um, a, a shot of the Western Basin and the monitoring stations that we have. Um, it's really a mix. Some of them are ours, some are USGS, some of the universities. Um, and we're right now going through and doing an assessment of finding out if all of these, we won't move any of these, but we need to figure out do we need additional monitoring? Um, and I think the answer is yes, but then it's like two questions. Where do we put them and how do we pay for them? Um, so we, we, it's going to be very important for us to be monitoring not just the main stem but the tributaries in the Maumee, Maumee River to see what response we're having by the practices that we're putting in and are we getting closer to this number that uh, the Phosphorus 2 Task Force came up with which is this 40% reduction of phosphorus moving into the basin. So knowing that we weren't done um, with Senate Bill 150, we also moved um, this year Governor Kasich signed. Senate Bill 1 um, on April 2nd of this year. And this was a, a continuation of the efforts that we had been working on in Senate Bill 150. The biggest thing that we did here was we banned the practice of taking manure and commercial fertilizer and putting it on snow and frozen ground. And you think that's intuitive. Um, again, it seems more of like a disposal practice than a, than a nutrient management practice. Um, but and best management practices um, that are taught to farmers would suggest that they would not do this. Um, but in many cases, they don't have an option. They generate so much manure, uh, they don't have the storage capacity. This year was a classic example of that. Um, the winter was long, ground stayed frozen. Um, we had snow well into, into spring. Um, they, went, they, they ran out of storage capacity and they were having to reapply this manure at, at times when they shouldn't have. Then we had some really heavy rains, and that's a practice that we just have to get away from. Um, so we banned that practice. Um, we're doing phosphorus monitoring and optimization at our wastewater treatment plants, not just in the Lake Erie Basin, but across the state, to make sure that if they've got a limit for phosphorus, is it is it appropriate? Is it below one part per million? And if they don't, what's the cost so we can help them fund uh, upgrading their capacity um, to have a limit that is at one part per million or less? And then we banned the placement of lake, of open lake placement of dredge material after the year 2020. And I'm going to go through this one quick because we talked most about it. It seems rather intuitive to me. 
Um, we don't want it in the lake. Um, we're going to keep it out of the lake by 2020, but we really then own it. As I say, we've got to figure out what to do with it. I don't know where we're going to put 3 million cubic yards of dredge material, but we've got a team that's coming together right now um, to help. Some of these ideas um, are, one, putting it back on the land in, in areas where we can do um, um, nutrient enhancement in some lower quality farm fields, but also we take that and turn it into compost. We turn it into areas that we can do brownfield development in cities like Cleveland and Detroit where we're seeing a lot of homes torn down because they're vacant. You've got to fill those basements in and we're seeing a lot of um, use for material like that. So, you know, the governor uh, is always challenging us to come up with new ways. And he, in, his, in his mind, he's like, we don't own the lake. You know, we have a piece of it. We're a major contributor to it. We're a major user to it. It's an $11 billion industry to the state of Ohio um, in terms of travel and tourism. But we don't own it. We have other partners of Indiana. We have Michigan. We have Ontario. We've got our other states in the eastern part. Um, so his challenge was, how do we work together? How do we work together with, uh, in the Binational Water Quality Agreement that, again, Dr. Reuter and others are involved with, this, pro this process called Annex 4, which is really coming up with a process um, that will give us some enforceable targets on how much phosphorus and nutrients that we can have coming out of our waterways. How do we work with some other longstanding organizations like the Great Lakes Commission and the Water Quality Board for the International Joint Commission? and Council of Great Lakes Governors. How do we interact with them? They're all doing things in this space, just like all of, a lot of our universities are doing work in this space. How do we focus that work um, around a common goal? What we did was we talked with uh, Michigan and Ontario. We talked with Indiana, too, um, but we signed a really simple collaborative agreement just a few months ago, maybe about a month ago, and it, was, it really said three things. It was the first time ever that anybody has, we've done a lot of things, we've spent a lot of money, but it's the first time that we've recognized that 40% number for phosphorus reduction, where we said science tells us we need to reduce that. And we say, you know what, we're going to acknowledge that um, and commit to that. So that was the first thing it did. The second was it banded us together on how we're going to um, work together to do common mon monitoring and measurement, and that we're going to have um, act uh, plans put in place to see this reduction happen by the year 2025. This agreement took about six months to negotiate just because Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio saw the importance of it and we saw how important it needed to be. Um, in contrast, you look at um, the agreement by all the states in the Mississippi Delta and the hypoxia, it took them 15 years to get that done. And a lot more states, maybe a lot more complex issue, but um, I think we're starting to see um, some heightened awareness, and I think Indiana may actually come along, and if they don't sign the agreement, that's okay, um, but we're going to need their collaboration and participation in this as well. So I'm going to switch gears and, and talk about drinking water. So one of the first things that we did um, is spend a lot of time with US EPA. The standards that we use on setting limits about um, contaminants in drinking water relative to harmful algal blooms or microcystin or some of the other common ones like cylindrospermopsin, anatoxin A, saxitoxin. Those limits are the best science that we have, but frankly, they're very old. And it's based on old World Health Organization data that's probably 15 years old or more. Is that right, Justin? That's pretty old. Yeah, really old. Um, and there's not a lot of new science out there, but it's the best that we had. It actually set the limit to say you can have this much this much microcystin in the water and then it's safe to drink or it's not. Um, we, re we recognized that when the, when the day came that we had to tell Toledo that the drinking water wasn't safe, we had a strategy put in place that said if you get to a certain limit, you got to tell people they can't drink the water. It's black and white. Um, but we also knew that that science was really old. We needed to update that. Um, we were while US EPA was very helpful to us, and they've got an Office of Water and Research in Cincinnati, um, they were very helpful to us. Um, we also needed to push them um, to say, we have to update this science. Um, so I spent time actually testifying before Congress on, on this issue about federal guidelines for microcystin. Um, and just yesterday, um, Congressman Portman and Lada's bill passed, passed the Senate. Um, giving, again, more direction to US EPA on continuing to renew their science 
about microcystin and developing a national response, a national policy response relative to microcystin and what's safe in your drinking water. So we're very active also in working with UPPA to look at their science, advance the science and say, is there enough science to say, can you refine your guidelines more about what is safe and what is not to drink? Because you've seen the real world implications of that. So once EPA, uh, US EPA just released its new health advisory levels um, for microcystin, and I'll go through that in a minute, but we coordinate with Ohio Department of Health on implementing those. We also spend a huge amount of time um, working with, when you take a half a million people and tell them you can't drink the water, you're then also responsible for providing them drink, healthy drinking water to drink. So that takes a huge amount of coordination with the Ohio Emergency Management Association, Department of Health, other state agencies, including the National Guard, um, for us on how we mobilize and manage a, a significant disaster like that. Frankly, we had never done it before. Um, and while we got it done, uh, we obviously needed to refine that process quite a bit. So we spent the last year, this last year, refining that process, doing tabletop organizationals, doing real world studies, um, doing real, real life um, trial runs of that with the city of Toledo, just as an example, um, to be ready and prepared um, if we were to ever have a situation like we had before. We also have done huge amounts of outreach to our public water systems. We've got hundreds and hundreds of public water systems across the state, but there's about 129, 130 of them that, that rely on surface water, Lake Erie, smaller inland lakes, as their primary source of drinking water. Um, we needed to make sure that, one, if we were giving them some of that money I talked about, that they were um, upgrading their processes, that they were having developing contingency plans. Um, but, so we've been out working with every one of these. There's 23 of these that get their water directly from Lake Erie. We've been out working with every one of these for the past year to get them to optimize their system, really understand how their drinking water treatment plants work, how they can optimize their system by adding some new treatment technologies like powder activated carbon, how they can manage their system a little better um, out in their distribution system by having some chlorine residuals, but not too much, that also has an impact on microcystin. It's so really a complex system if you think about it, taking water out of Lake Erie and turning it into potable drinking water that you can then put through your distribution system to somebody's house. Um, it doesn't happen easily and it's a really complex set of chemistry going on back and forth in the system. You need to manage all pieces of that. If you move one little piece a little bit, you're going to have a response somewhere else. Um, so we really spend a lot of time. In fact, I think, Jeff, you said one of the groups that's coming up here for the workshops, you're going to have 60 drinking water plant operators up here learning from my staff and others about how to optimize their treatment for drinking water. And we will not stop doing this because while we can give them lots of advice, and frankly I can give them a lot of money to upgrade their plant, they are at the tip of the spear here um, on running their plant. If they can't run their plant effectively, uh, we're the ones that are ultimately all going to have the problem. Um, so I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts. Yes, Lake Erie and our inland lakes have seasonal water crawler problems, and we don't have all the answers. And I don't know if we ever will, um, just because we'll always keep learning and adapting to what these new challenges are. Um, I am proud to say that this governor and this administration, this legislature, some may challenge this and say that it's not enough, but we're actually taking a lot of progressive steps, both legislatively, policy, and financially, to get our arms around this. What is it? Um, what is our issue? How can we manage it? And then how do we ultimately fix this problem. But government can't do this alone, and we are needing all of our sectors engaged, including the private sector. Um, so as I say, we're going to continue adaptive management, or else I, I call it sometimes building the airplane as it goes down the runway, um, in hopes that through data collection and implementation, monitoring, making adjustments, that by the time we get that airplane at the end of that runway, it's going to fly. Um, and I think we're off to a pretty good start. So if I could, Kevin, can you switch me over to the mm -hmm. other presentation? While he does that, um, Jeff, can I just take a few questions here on yeah, that? Yeah, that would be a good time to okay. do it. I'm in the process of tweeting photos of all the solutions that you've given us right now. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Yeah. So, yeah, you got questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so we have these guidelines. Mm -hmm. 
So the one, the one, uh, the one piece that is enforceable uh, is this ban on the snow, snow and frozen covered ground and application. You know, our best enforcement tool is um, people that live in the area. Um, so we're right now also in the process of transferring uh, that program out of the Department of Natural Resources over to the Department of Agriculture. Um, they already manage all of our CAFO efforts, big, large factory farms. Um, it's very confusing. Didn't seem to make a lot of sense, but if you're a, a large animal feeding operation, agriculture operation, you went to the Department of Agriculture, as you can imagine, to get your permits. Um, but if you had a smaller farm and you uh, you would go to the Department of Natural Resources for soil and water conservation. We're bringing them all together. Um, so the best the best thing is always word of mouth. Um, that's our best enforcement tool. Uh, but we've got any number of inspectors that will have to tag EPA and DNR um, that will be out monitoring for these issues around snow and frozen covered ground. So that, that's number one. So, um, you know, we've got We've got a series of inspectors too that go out, and as well as soil and water conservation um, officers um, through the Soil and Water Conservation Services that'll be out um, making sure that if we have, if they're managing their manure properly, if they have manure storage. Um, but largely, I'll tell you, it, it, it depends on the farmer doing the right thing and following best management practices. There is a continued call to say we need to do more work, and I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't, um, but there is. Um, discussion now to say we need more enforceable programs um, to make sure that the agriculture community um, is um, either through a permit process or through some other certification process um, actively um, managing this and that we have an enforcement mechanism to do it. Any others? I'm just going to transition quickly and take a, a few minutes on this. So this is um presentation that I gave as well as uh, Mike Baker, who's my division chief in a drinking and groundwater program. And I talked about US EPA working with federal EPA about redefining, pulling together the new science around microcystin and how much is safe in drinking water. And a lot of work has gone into the update of our strategy, which really incorporates a lot of the new federal data on, on what is safe. Um, so again, we began sampling in 2010 for cyanotoxins at public water systems. Um, and we shortly thereafter came up with a, an initial strategy that followed the World Health Organization to say if you had one part per billion in your finished drinking water, that was the trigger to say it was unsafe to drink. Safe, unsafe to drink. Um, in 2015, we came up with our new one, incorporating EPA's new health advisory data for this microcystin that it, generally everybody talks about, and some of the others like Solyndris bromopsin. There are others. And frankly, within the microcystin world, and Justin, you know a lot more about this than I do, that in the microcystin world, there's cogeners there. There's probably 100, maybe more, um, different types, um, some of which we know a lot about and some of which we know absolutely nothing about um, in terms of their toxicity to humans and or animals. So here's what, um, here's what we have, um, I think, graduated to relative to drinking water thresholds for these microcystins, cylinders, bromopsin, saxotoxin, anatoxin. Before it was uh, in microcystin, it was do not drink, it was one, one part, per, one part per billion in your finished drinking water, black and white, on off. Below it, you can drink it. Above it, you can't. Um, so the new health advisory numbers are a little different in that they say you can't drink it, if it's at 0.3 part per billion, which is virtually at the detection limit of the equipment. Um, but it's for children under six, and then we add at the state of Ohio, we added in this sensitive population. We also have included nursing pregnant women, individuals with liver disease, or those on dialysis. Why? Generally because these, these toxins are, um, they will impact uh, liver function. So if you've already have a, um, a decreased liver function, um, we want you to not be drinking the water. Great. That, yes. That's, when you say we added the state of Ohio, that's above and beyond what was recommended by this. Yeah. They, um, they pretty much, US EPA, um, in their recommendation, um, said do not drink if it's six years and under. And then for these sensitive populations said they may not want to drink it. 
they were less than definitive about that. Um, so we were um, concerned about the risk factor enough there um, to include them in that sensitive population. So the, the do not drink advisory for anybody over six and older adults is higher than the one part per billion that it used to be. But, um, this stays the same. This is our recreational contact number of 20, um, and it's a do not use, which is do not touch it. Don't have any contact with the water at all. Um, and they've, they made some adjustments here on cylindrous bromopsin. They didn't have enough data here on these other um, yeah, um, toxins here for saxitoxin and anatoxin to really make any changes at all. They said we just don't have any, any new data here to make a change on these. Um, but as you can also see what they have done here is this is not a black and white number. Um, it may be at 0.3 or at 1.6, but they also said it's a 10-day standard. So if you're drinking water at these limits, you're safe to do that for up to 10 days um, before you would have to avoid drinking the water. So <coughs> that's an important piece because I call it um, a do not drink advisory limit with a cushion. Um, and uh, you'll see how we use that cushion to help give us some operational time and treatment time to fix a public drinking water system treatment system um, within that 10-day window so that we're being able to um, have continued <coughs> drinking water use. So they also talked about analytical methods. Um, they've gravitated and, and talked about ELISA being their predominant way. Um, when you look at Salindus bromopsin, I heard you talk about your new LCMSMS machine. Um, they're using that here as a repeat sampling um, determinant. Um, I always look at, you know, when I try to explain things very, very broadly, I say ELISA is like, do you have microcystin or one of those hundreds of variations of microcystin in your drinking water? Is any one of them there or are they all in there? You can use ELISA to do that. If you want to find out exactly which cogener of microcystin you have in there, you use a much more refined um, um, testing methodology like LCMS and has to do that. So we, took a, we take a lot of um, data into account, and here's another piece of data that we use looking at, at the NOAA, but we get public water systems uh, doing their weekly phytoplankton monitoring. We have them go out and do weekly assessments so they're where they're getting their water from if they're a surface water system. We get bloom reports from third parties. We look at remote sensing data. We got some data. We got some data. We got this data. We picked up the phone and we called both Ottawa County and Toledo and said, make sure your systems are running properly. Um, so we spend a lot of time just forecasting where we're going to be doing sampling, taking screening, taking an, um, a look at what the raw water quality is. And so the issue is we're going to go out and monitor data. We're going to collect and analyze samples. Um, when we see conditions like this. Um, we're going to say that we're asking our water systems to take samples every week, be monitoring their system and taking samples every week. But if we're starting to see in the running tests and they're seeing microcystin in their raw water of this five um, micrograms per liter of parts per billion, in two consecutive samples, we're having them upgrade their sampling to three times a week so that we get more, more data to be working on. This is, this is a, a messy graph, but it basically tells you that you're doing their monitoring as normal. If you have detections in your raw water, but it's either above or below the five parts per billion, what we want you to do in terms of sampling. Either you continue doing your weekly sampling on the left if it's less than five parts per billion. If it's more, we want you to do three. If you're getting consecutive samples that are lower, you kind of go all the way back to the top. So it's a cycle that we just want them to keep monitoring their raw water to see if they hit this target of five micrograms per liter or not. This is in their raw water. This is the Sentinel test that we want them to be paying attention to. Now we switch over. What if you get it in your finished water? Cyanotoxin to detection in finished water, uh, we're going to immediately switch uh, to daily 
if it's detected below the threshold. So we talked about the 0.3 number. 0.3 is virtually the detection number for the ELISA equipment. Um, US EPA's number is 0.3. Take some significant digit into account there. It's actually 0.345. So you can actually have a detection that's below the limit. Um, but nonetheless, um, so we could have a detection that's below the limit and not have to issue an advisory for do not drink of the water. But what it does trigger is another cascade of um, events for us in terms of monitoring and sampling. The first thing that we get in our finished water, if we have a hit of drinking water in finished drinking water, is we're going to reanalyze the sample. We want to do that to see if we had a lab error, first and foremost. The second thing is we're immediately going to go collect and analyze another finished water sample. Um, we're going to see if we had consistent information. So we're going to resample that, and we need to get um, two. Uh, we need to get a repeat sample. So we need to take a repeat sample to confirm that. If we get all of those, it's an ongoing sampling process. If the reanalysis and resamples are above the threshold, the first thing we're going to do is put out some public messaging to say you have you have psych microcystin in your finished drinking water. Now it's not going to be a do not drink advisory. Um, it may include an advisory, um, but it's going to be based on a couple of many factors because we have this 10-day window to be managing the system. We're going to say, when was their last non-detect finished sample? Uh, we're going to look at the concentration of cyanotoxin in the water. We're going to see if they have any treatment capabilities because some systems do not have treatment capabilities, um, whether the toxin levels are trending up or down based on our repeat samples and the type of cyanotoxin that's present. All of those are going to come into play, um, and until we know all of that data, we're not going to be able to tell you um, exactly when we might have to issue a do not drink advisory. It's going to be, it could be sometime, it could be on day one, or it could be on day nine, um, depending on the, on the sensitivities that we see here. But if we have repeat samples that are above the threshold, we'll recommend that the water system issue a public notice, telling the public that there's microcystin in the drinking water. Um, and then from there we'll be able to help them adjust. If we get to a point where <clears throat> if, re if those repeat results are above the threshold, we will recommend the water system issue that, take all of these into account. There's another messy graph, but really just um, kind of gives a, a graphic representation of that messaging process. Let me quickly go through this here. So I guess the, that's a lot of um, a lot of graphs and talks about, but one thing, a couple of things that are important. Um, we're thankful to US EPA for working with us to come up with some of the re refining this science. Um, you saw what a catastrophic event event it is when you tell a half a million people, um, if not others, that they can't drink their water. First and foremost, we want the data to be right so we can tell people that are safe. Um, we think that these new these new values certainly advancing the science. We've adapted a process around it. It's not exactly clear cut, as you can see, um, but we have been out talking with all the public drinking water um, operators that are going to be in here. are probably going to see that presentation or something close to it. Um, they're going to get uh, a lot of site visits from us to help them run their systems appropriately. Um, and just a few weeks ago, when we had a heavy bloom around the, uh, around the islands, um, we had our drinking water operators at Putin Bay and in the Kelly's Island drinking water plants for over 20 hours, just helping them optimize their systems and run them to make sure they're providing safe drinking water. So this is a huge challenge for us. This is stretching our um, financial and, um, frankly, human resources um, significantly. Um, and frankly, we're even um, uh, imposing upon Justin here. We kept him up, him up very, very late uh, over the weekend. Um, because he does a lot of sampling for us on the, on the samples that are taken here. So, Justin, my thanks to you um, uh, for helping us. Um, but we could not be focused on this any more clearly than we are. We're doing everything we can to, um, one, understand the science, and two, to keep, frankly, something happening like what happened in the Toledo a few years ago. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Dr.
questions for Director Butler? I've got a, a, a couple here on the uh, uh, new guidelines. First, I think they're they're really good. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, are you issuing you meaning Ohio EPA? Are you issuing guidelines for what the water treatment plant should do, or are you telling them they have to do that? Is, and and when it comes to if, if a do not drink order mm -hmm. became necessary. Mm -hmm. Is that issued by you or by the water treatment plant? Uh, good question. Um, we're, uh, we are in the one of the last slides. There was about our rulemaking process. We are we are basically putting all of this process in rule, so that it will be a, a requirement uh, for the water plant operators to follow it. Um, we're engaging with them and, and working with them on these rules. We have told them these are all guidelines, but you have to follow them. <laughs> because we're putting them in rule. And frankly, they want the help, so in all fairness to them. In terms of issuing a do not drink advisory, um, I think we'd always follow the method we did with uh, Mayor Collins in Toledo. Um, I had to make the phone call to the mayor and say, you've got drinking cyanotoxin in your drinking water above this limit. Um, and I'm going to recommend to you that, Mayor, you go out to your residence and, is and issue um, a do not drink advisory. Um, which he did. Um, but if he had chosen not to, I would have. Um, I have the authority to do that. And um, if we ever get to a point where we need to do that independently of a water system and or a political structure, we will do it. We'll do that. Yeah. So, this is new, new rules and these new guidelines. If these have been in place last year during the drinking crisis, would, we, would you have um, recommended a new drinking mm. Yes, um, it would have been um, since the, the the limit prior to the new um, advisory number was one part per billion, and now you got 0.3 and 1.6. Um, our our limits levels of cyanotoxin in finished drinking water in Toledo were almost two and a half. So no matter at 1.6 or at one, we would have had a, a recommended do not drink advisory. Um, for everybody. Um, we also would have had, um, it would have been shorter on the back end because we got um, below 1.6. We hovered in between 1 and 1.6 for about a day when we did some confirmatory samples. But we also had numbers prior to going over 1 that would have triggered for the 0.3 for a smaller, for the sensitive populations and children under 6. So how does the 10 so that if we have, if we get any hit in finished drinking water above those uh, levels, it's not an absolute black and white do not drink. We've got time to optimize the system. First thing we'll do is we'll go out and tell people that there's that there's microcystin in the drinking water. It's above a threshold, but it's the water is still safe to drink because it's a 10-day standard. Um, but based on all of those other factors, those other factors that we look at is really a determinant on how quickly we pull the plug. Um, if we can get the plant optimized quickly, within 24 hours, 48 hours, and they bring the results back down, we'll then come back to the public and say the water has no microcystin, but it was still safe to drink. If we go two days into it and we see microcystin levels still increasing and or they have no treatment capability at all, which we have some systems, we'll be very quick to do that. But we, what we will not do is just say, you've got 10 days, run 10 days and see what happens. Um, some of the public drinking water operators would prefer um, that they be able to use a full 10 days in that process. And frankly, they're quite upset with us that we will not let them do that. Um, but we just don't think it's safe to do that. I, I, it sounded like from your hierarchy there that you were you were sort of back, back calculating, looking at when the last sample mm -hmm. was taken. Yep. And so if the last sample was taken a week ago, you would sort of pick a worst case scenario and say we might have had it this high for the past seven days. That's correct. We'd have no other choice. Yeah. We'd have no other choice to assume that. Um, in February, or I take that back, in May, early May is when EPA issued their new guideline. I mean, literally the day, the next day, and it turned out to be a lab error for us, but we had a small community. It wasn't even in Lake Erie, but it was over in eastern Ohio, called us on, it always happens on Friday. These bad things happen on Friday. Friday afternoon, they called and said, boy, we've got 
we've got microcystin in our finished drinking water at like two and a half, and everybody went, ah, you know, crazy. Um, and the first question I asked them, I said, when was the last time you tested for microcystin? And they said, January 6th. <laughs> you know, so when we're trying to figure out what we tell people, um, it's going to be largely dependent because we have a 10-day window. We need to know the last time they sampled. That's a good safety measure. Yeah. Any other questions for Director Butler? Greg, thank you again. You're welcome. <laughs> again, students, uh, good luck with your finals on uh, Saturday. And uh,